Hello, everyone, and welcome back to China Observer. I'm your host, Peter. For today's story, we're taking a step back from the current affairs for a little bit to talk about Huawei's princess Meng Wanzhou and the luxurious and carefree life she still lives under house arrest and surveillance. Just a quick recap: This 48-year-old CFO of Huawei was arrested two years ago on December 1st of 2018 by the Canadian RCMP at the Vancouver International Airport. She was arrested on an extradition request from the U.S. for violating U.S. law in fraudulent banking transactions to evade international sanctions against Iran. Since her detention, Meng has been taking various judicial steps to avoid her extradition to the United States for trial. At a hearing last May, Meng was found to meet the U.S. and Canadian dual criminality standard, and remains in detention in Canada pending an extradition hearing. As Huawei's CFO, it's obvious that she's stinking rich. In fact, Meng was so wealthy that immediately after her arrest. She spent an em- enormous amount of money to hire and form her own team of lawyers. Then she was released on a ten million dollar bail to buy herself a certain amount of freedom. Now she's living in Vancouver's upscale Shaughnessy neighborhood in a seven bedroom mansion estimated to be worth around fourteen million Canadian dollars, which is around eleven million USD. And that's not all. She has attendants who regularly come and give her drawing lessons and to give her massages to help her relax, because living under house arrest is so tiring, right? Now, in her bail conditions, she is required to wear a GPS tracker on her foot and be monitored by a security team 24 hours a day to be paid for by her, which is said to be around 1.6 million USD a year. And then, besides a curfew from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., and that she's not allowed to be near any airports, she can practically do whatever she wants. Instead of being treated like an actual prisoner or a detainee, it's as if she's simply being freed of her CFO responsibilities and is now just living comfortably like a rich retired person. For example, before the COVID-19 pandemic, she also went to attend a concert of some Chinese singer. And during the pandemic, she literally booked entire shopping mall and took her entourage and security guards inside to literally shop until she drops. And this past Christmas, Meng's family and her friends, a group of 14 people, booked a restaurant in Vancouver to celebrate. Like, is that even allowed given the COVID restrictions in Canada? I mean, I guess if if you have enough money, you can do whatever you want, right? Now her extravagant behavior drew strong criticism and outrage from Canadians everywhere, saying that she's maximizing her life and freedom during Canada's judicial transition period. Now, if that hasn't angered you yet, here's something else that happened. Recently, on January 12th, at her bail variation hearing, her legal team made another request—a ridiculous one, may I add—that she be allowed to leave her home without any security. So pretty much, she doesn't want to be watched anymore. Her team argued that the pandemic has affected her life negatively, and that her security detail could put her more at risk to the coronavirus. The prosecution rebutted, saying that she and her family already violated pandemic rules and restrictions from having large gatherings and going out to eat, and this is among other violations too. So honestly, at this point, I just feel like they're being way too soft on her, given what she's done. Doug Maynard, who's the president of the security firm in charge of enforcing Meng's bail conditions, warned that as Meng's extradition trial enters its final few months, there's an increased risk that she will flee Canada to avoid facing U.S. fraud and conspiracy charges. He said that if he loosened the security around her. It could provide an opportunity for those who want to hurt her or help her escape, both of which could prevent her from appearing in court. He also pointed out that Meng's GPS ankle bracelet has failed several times, and that someone familiar with the technology could easily block or disable the device. At the hearing, prosecutor John Gibb Carsley said Huawei chartered a Boeing 777. From China Southern Airlines to try and take Meng back to China before the ruling was announced last May, 
However, the court ruled that Meng met the double criminality standard and that Meng could not leave. Therefore, Huawei's plans to get her back to China fell through. According to AFP, an official confirmed on January 13th that Canada has granted a travel waiver for Meng's husband and two children, so they can join her in Vancouver. At the extradition trial on January 12th, it was revealed that Meng's husband arrived last October, and her children had arrived last December. In an email to AFP, Canadian Foreign Affairs Minister's Office said that Meng's family was authorized by IRCC, which stands for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. IRCC officials had granted her to travel to Canada. Recently, Ottawa has also made exceptions to its travel restrictions, including for reasons such as family reunions. So you see, Meng's life even after imprisonment has pretty much remained unaffected and unhindered. In stark contrast, however, the two Canadians, known as the two Michaels, have been illegally sentenced to prison and have been accused of espionage by the Chinese government. Over the past two years, they have been living under harsh conditions in China, isolated from their families and without any lawyers to fight for their legal rights. And honestly, I don't even think in China you have any legal rights anyways, or any rights for that matter. So the CCP can simply just slap on some random charges on you and then lock you up arbitrarily for however long they want. They've been doing it for years. And in this case, it's clear that the two Michaels were arrested purely as a form of retaliation from the CCP in response to Meng's arrest in Canada. This is seen as an instance of China's hostage diplomacy, which I think is very much unethical and illegal. The two Michaels are Michael Kovrig, a former Canadian diplomat, and Michael Spavor, a businessman and expert on North Korea. The two were arrested in China on December 10th of 2018 and have been imprisoned for more than two years. During this period, Canadian human rights activists have organized and held protests calling on China to release the two Michaels. They were also calling on the Canadian government to help but to no avail. According to Global News, Canadian ambassador to China, Dominic Barton, said the Chinese communist authorities denied the embassy and consulate staff access to the two Michaels from January to October of last year, reason being they needed to limit the spread of COVID-19. Now, during a meeting of the House Select Committee on Canadian-Chinese Relations, Barton said they weren't even allowed to connect with the two by video. It's not like the virus can be transmitted digitally, right? So after months of delay, Barton was finally allowed to meet the Michaels by video on November 10th and November 19th. He mentioned that the two Michaels are staying strong and unyielding and that he was deeply touched. Um, as you said outright, I, I'm limited by the Privacy Act in terms of what I can discussed in any detail. What, what I would say is that uh, they are both very healthy physically and mentally. Um, I have to tell you, I'm deeply inspired by their resilience and their uh, mindset. Um, it's, it's incredible, uh, given uh, what, what they're going through. It's very sad. I mean, what's there to yield when you have done nothing wrong in the first place? The two Michaels were arbitrarily detained based on accused espionage, which is just an excuse to get back at Canada for arresting Huawei's princess. Now, according to Barton, not only has the CCP prevented Canada from accessing prisoners deemed to be a national security threat to China, but the United States and the United Kingdom face similar restrictions. Former Canadian ambassador to China, David Mulroney, said that the Canadian legal process and every step taken in Meng's case was a reflection of the rule of law and a civilized democratic society. This is as, as opposed to the two Canadians detained by the Chinese government, who were illegally deprived of all of their rights and were brutally treated. You know, Meng still enjoys all the benefits of the Canadian justice system. She is like living in a, like a princess. In the system, while China's so called legal process doesn't even exist. 
So that gives you a bit of perspective on both sides, and this absolutely infuriated many Canadians. Like there are so many instances of good people, innocent people, being wronged, arrested, persecuted, or even killed. And the CCP is notorious for going after and persecuting those that they deem to be a threat to the party or a threat to its rule, including whistleblowers and those who refuse to be brainwashed by their propaganda, especially people of faith, so like house Christians, Catholics, Tibetan Buddhists, Falun Gong practitioners. And because not many countries are taking action against them, they've grown even more cocky. And now they're going after those outside of mainland China. We saw what happened in Hong Kong, right? So, pretty much, those that cannot be controlled must be silenced, and that is how communism works. And more people need to realize that. Anyways, that is all for today. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give us a thumbs up. It really does motivate us. And if you like our content, be sure to subscribe. Should I mention I've also created a channel on a new social media platform called Safe Chat, in hopes of staying connected with everyone and avoiding big tech censorship. So I encourage everyone to go register and follow me there, where we'll have more freedom to talk and about a wider variety of、uh, topics and subjects in a more casual manner. The link will be in the description and comment section below. So follow me if you're interested. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.